my colleague Christine's when we were both recording war memorials for the uh, Imperial War Museum who were making a archive of every memorial in the land. And going around various churches, chapels, and factories in Leicester, we were concerned that some of them were obviously badly protected. And there was one church in particular which gave us great cause for concern, and that was St. Saviour's Church in Highfields. And that particular wonderful church had 15 war memorials in it and a memorial chapel. And the church had been closed in the year 2005, and it was not properly protected at all. And we thought, well, we need to do something to give these memorials a bit of care and attention. Luckily, we had photographed them all, and shortly after that, the vandals got in through one of the war memorial stained glass windows, which we had wanted to remove, and they stole all of them and smashed the remainder and reduced the memorial chapel to matchwood. So that was the that was the beginning of this, and we then had to find somewhere where we could put these memorials. And we had been in touch with then Heritage Lottery Fund, who were extremely generous to us. And we were at the same time negotiating with Churches Conservation Trust concerning the licensing of our stay here in the deconsecrated chapel of All Saints. So we had a base, we had some money, and we then started, started to accumulate frequently at very short notice and also by accident various memorials and here they are there was a fascinating story among the memorials at St Saviour's were two five foot tall candlesticks uh, wooden with an engraving little tablet on the bottom that said in memory of warden W Pratt and parishioners of this church who were killed by enemy action on the 19th of November 1940 when the Germans bombed Highfields and quite a few people were killed and a lot of houses damaged. Those candlesticks vanished. And I had a piece in the Leicester Mercury in the Mr. Leicester column saying, where are they now? Not a whisper, not a word. And then several years later, out of the blue, a phone call from someone who said, I see that you've been looking for these candlesticks. We said, yes. And this chap said, yes, he had one of them and they were using it as a church candlestick in Cold Overton. So my colleague Chris Stevens and I went up to see this chap and yes, it was in good condition. It was being used for a proper purpose. So we decided to leave it there, but added a little brass plaque saying one of a pair from St. Saviour, originally from St. Saviour's. Still one missing. So another article in Mr. Lester, one down, one to go blow me down. The following morning, I had a phone call from Karen in Mablethorpe saying I have your candlestick. So my colleague and I went over to Mablethorpe and we met Karen who had it there. She used to patrol that area. She had a passionate love of St. Saviour's and she'd seen the door open, the candlestick damaged on the ground, taken it home and then several years later moved to Mablethorpe. So we now have it back here. But what an incredible story. So there was another article of Mr. Lester saying we now have them both. They're fantastic stories. All of the memorials have real sagas behind them. Danger, loss, stole, stolen. Well, I've always been interested in military history. I've always been interested in memorials. I do a lot of work on the memorial at home, uh, history of the men and so on. And it, it just struck both of us at the time that this was an area that was broadly overlooked. Everyone knows what a war memorial is. Obviously, the centenary of the Great War has had a major impact on people's appreciation of war memorials. But before that, they were just, they were just something. And it was obvious that uh, the care and attention was required, particularly uh, with the sort of change of the way the city has gone from closed churches, chapels, factories, clubs in particular. Uh, the buildings have changed their use. The war memorials, quite honestly, to the new owners were a nuisance. And they had to be put, uh, put somewhere. And so, really, we, we got on with it. 
have people been receptive to the ideas of us looking after their memorials? I would say almost universally yes. Uh, in fact, there's a wonderful story about the window of the Aylston Working Men's Club. My colleague and I, Chris, were at a meeting on a Monday night. Someone whispered in our ear that there was a war memorial for sale this coming Friday. And we went down to the auction house and we saw the auctioneer and we looked at this thing and wow, it is an 11 foot 6 inch tall stained glass window about 5 foot 6 inches wide. Magnificent thing. Uh, from the Second World War, and it's got 1939, 1945 at the top. It's got the Leicester Regiment Tiger, Hindustan, in the top there. It's got the crests of all the arms around the side, and in the centre are the four symbols of the four nations of, of the United Kingdom, and a wonderful plaque in the middle. And we said, well, what's going to happen to this? We explained who we were, obviously. What's going to happen to this memorial? And he said, well, almost certainly it will be shipped to the United States. And we explained that we didn't think that was a particularly good idea. And it really was a part of the city's heritage. And he said he would ring the vendor and ring me back that night. This was on the Thursday, the auction being on the Friday. And he duly did. And the, he said, well, it had cost the vendor a lot of money. And he... 500 pounds. We don't buy war memorials, we don't sell war memorials, but in this instance we thought, right, we did a deal. And to be fair to that vendor, he has never cashed the check. We then had the fun of getting it back here, which was another saga, but that's the sort of story behind some of these memorials. The, the other one, of course, is the Belgrave Liberal Club that was stolen. It was folded in two because the really intelligent thieves thought that it wouldn't be recognised. They took it to the scrap metal dealer and he knew exactly what their game was. He gave them their money but took all their details and they had their collars fingered by the police. And then, bless his heart, he and his son tried to flatten it by running a JCB over it. So that is part of its history and if you look at it closely you'll see there's a great crease down the middle. What another wonderful tale of excitement. We have regular open days, um, which are advertised on our website. We participate in heritage open days as well in September, along with every, everyone else in the city. And if, there is a, if a group of people would like to come and see, we are very happy to open up specially uh, with pleasure because um, I give talks to various clubs, institutions, U3A, British Legion and so on and so on and we do try and arrange group visits and we give them tea and buns as well. So it's a bonus. Our view is that probably what we are doing here in Leicester giving sanctuary in effect, taking into care war memorials, is that it ought to be replicated right across the country. I cannot believe that there aren't other large cities that don't have the same changes taking place with closed buildings and change of use and war morals in the same situation. The one thing I would like to say though is wherever we can we do try and put a war memorial back into its original setting where it is safe so to do and we have had some spectacular successes in, in that 